Well, first of all, I have to say thanks very much to ABCA for asking us to um, put in this discussion piece to do a little bit of scene setting for you. It's quite flattering to be asked to do something on the other side of the world, so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and I hope that this framework will help the discussion move along. When we're talking about the relationship between identity and other businesses, I mean whether payments or any other business, um, we have quite a, a simple and quite useful model that we call the three R's model. So we talk about recognition, relationships and reputation. And I'll just take you through each of those to see how they uh, help to frame the discussion. So the first one is recognition. Recognition is uh, the word that we use for the appropriate combination of identification and authentication that's necessary for a transaction. And I, and I stress <clears throat> appropriate combination because obviously there are many different kinds of transactions and some of those transactions need very low levels of identification and authentication. In fact, some of them require no levels of identification at all, which we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, others would like quite high ones. So for example, um, an example I find quite easy to use is if I walk into a coffee shop to pay with PayPal um, and I buy a cup of coffee and my face shows up on the point of sale terminal and they hit OK and I walk off with my cup of coffee. Um, on my PayPal, it's not actually my face, it's a cartoon of my face. But the point is buying a cup of coffee, a cartoon of your face and the fact that you have the phone in your hand is you know, an adequate uh, combination of the two things. It's an adequate combination. Of, you know, you wouldn't use that to uh, launch nuclear missiles or something. I, you know, I, I imagine they have a pin code or something for that, so much stronger. Um, so the point about recognition is that it's the appropriate level of identification and authentication. Now, uh, and I should also say, um, uh, this is symmetrical. So in order for a business relationship to begin, you have to have a symmetrical uh, recognition because, because you, know, you need, you the bank or the shop uh, or the government, you need to recognize that it's me, but I need to recognize that it's you. I need to know that I'm really talking to the bank uh, and not to some fraudsters or, or other ne'er-do-well. So you need a mutual recognition. And uh, you know, while it's not the topic of this discussion, uh, I'm sure it's a key element of the DTO's thinking around this kind of thing, is that digital identity is verifiable in a way that physical identity is not. So that symmetry is much easier to establish in the digital world. So if I show you a picture of my driving license or something, you've, which they, ask, they might ask me for, you have essentially no way of verifying that. If I showed you a a British passport or something, you've got, you've got no way of knowing whether that's real or, or fake. You've got no way of being able to verify it. And similarly, if you show me a website that says, oh, you know, we're the bank, well, you know, whatever. But if you imagine, I don't know, like with Apple Pay, there's an app on my phone that's, that's got the right cryptography in it. So I go to log into the shop and something pops up on my phone. Well, now my, my phone is perfectly capable of telling whether it's the real shop or not. And, and the shop can talk to the app to find out if it's really me or not because of keys that are stored inside the phone and so on. So recognition actually in the digital environment um, is much better and much more effective than it is in the physical environment. And in fact, I, I saw some reports from the sessions at Cybos just today uh, with people arguing in the, in the uh, I think they called it the revolutionizing regulations session arguing precisely this, that the, the regulators uh, rather, rather sort of touching and dated reliance on face-to-face -face documentation actually doesn't make any sense because the digital stuff is much better. So that's the first point, is recognition. Once we've recognised each other, then we can have a relationship. And that relationship, which of course is now on a sounder footing because of the identification, which can also lead to appropriate uh, cryptography and encryption and all these other sorts of things uh, means we can now have a safe relationship with each other online and um, uh, and we can uh, and the implications of that is that we can share data confidently with each other because uh, you know I know that the data is only going to the bank and the bank is a regulated institution and I know that the bank is going to look after the data for me um, in appropriate ways whereas other people might not 
Now, actually, um, I mean, this leads into another element of thinking that you might want to draw in later on, which is there are actually good reasons for thinking. I've got good reasons for thinking. Um, and certainly some of the work that we've done for banks here and elsewhere leads me to, to this sort of conclusion, which is actually the perceptual model of a bank as a place where you store data, um, your, you store your data rather than storing your money, actually sort of makes more sense. If you look at the sort of big curves, the proportion of people's uh, overall wealth that's in the form of demand deposits at banks has been falling for, you know, a hundred years. I mean, after the Second World War, I think it was like two-thirds in the 70s, you were down to a third. I don't know what the figure is for Australia now, but I'd be surprised if it was, you know, 15% maybe. I mean, people, most of people's money isn't stored in the bank. It's stored in other places, uh, you know, mutual funds and stocks and shares and land and all sorts of other things. So the, so the mental model of a bank as a place where you store your money um, it's maybe a little bit misleading when we're trying to think about the new economy because actually what I want to store in the bank uh, is, is my personal data. This is along the lines of the SWIFT digital asset grid that they talked about a couple of years ago which um, you know, actually had the elements of a, of a good idea in it, I thought. Um, we'll, come back to, we'll come back to that in a moment. So the th actually, here's a good analogy for you. So as it happens, tonight uh, I'm going to Barcelona for, for Moby Forum and when I get to the hotel uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll take my credit cards and my passport and I'll lock them up in the hotel safe and when I go out to dinner I'll take a little prepaid card with me that's got some euros loaded onto it uh, and it doesn't have my name on it, it's a thing I got at the airport and just put some euros on. So it's like my important stuff I've left locked up um, and when I go out and about uh, spending um, uh, I'm just taking my little prepaid thing, which doesn't have any identification, personal identification uh, at all. Um, and I think that's a useful analogy. I mean, I want to leave my personal data locked up at the bank, and I want to go out and about on the internet. I want the bank to be my friend and protect me out on the internet. Um, which, of course, isn't quite what they do at the moment, because they make me uh, use my credit card to log on to things, which gives away all sorts of personal information. So, for example, if I was going to log on to make my new Ashley Madison account, they'd want a credit card to see that I'm over 18, right? Which, but in order to do that, I've got to give them my name and address and my billing address and whatever. And that means when the database gets hacked, as it inevitably will, uh, my personal data is, uh, is swept all over the internet. Um, <clears throat> you can see an alternative because the bank recognises me, I recognise the bank, we know each other the bank would be perfectly capable as part of that relationship of uh, keeping my identity blocked up but giving me some other, um, uh, let's call them attributes, uh, which I could use in other places. And that takes us on to the third point, which is reputation. Now, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this talk about the reputation economy and the idea that in the uh, collaborative economy to come, people's reputations are much more important than their money. If, if, you're go if I'm going to uh, rent my room to you for Airbnb, let me just take a trivial example, um, the fact that you've got money is really not that interesting. I mean, that's table stake. I mean, anybody that's going to rent it has got to have money. That's really very uninteresting. What I want to know is, are you a reliable person to rent this room to? Are you really who you say? Are you over 18? Are you really Australian? You know, have you rented an Airbnb before without trashing the place? Those elements of reputation are much more important than the, the money. And so this, this, I think, is the sort of, uh, you know, if I have a relationship with you, then over time, I can testify to certain attributes about you. And if you follow the thinking about keeping the personal data locked up in the bank, then what I want to do is I want to give you those attributes so you can take that reputation and feed it into other recognition processes. Uh, you know, so precisely in the case of something like Airbnb, um, you might want to prove that you're, uh, you know, you've are you got a bank account, and you, but you don't want to give away how much money in your bank account or which bank account it is or whatever. The bank could keep all of that safe and give you the attributes to pass it on. 
Now, and I'll give you a very concrete example of this that we've been talking about here recently, which is to do with tokenization, because obviously the tokenization infrastructure that's going into place is sort of an example of this, because my real card details are kept stored at the bank, right, in the vault, and what the bank puts in my iPhone, Samsung phone, Android phone is a token, an alias, if you like, to that real data. Uh, and you could take that, I mean, at the moment, we only use tokens for that one purpose, but you could imagine other tokens, you know, tokens that, you know, I, I, I land in Australia and the bank gives me a token that I can only use for a week and it only works in Australia and, and things like that. Or I have an adult token which says that I'm 18 or something like that. So, so this idea of um, uh, providing reputation that people can go out and use to form other uh, recognition processes and establish other relationships with people, uh, I think is quite powerful. And so that gives us the idea of this kind of mesh of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, attribute exchange where the identities themselves are kept safe and locked up. So I hope you see what I, what I mean by that. Now, obviously for that to happen, there have to be some sort of standards in place. And I mean, I don't want to sort of labor the point, but people do have to sort of talk to each other and work together. I, I don't think the banking industry has to invent any that, and there's no need for the payments people to come up with anything new. We already have OIX and OAuth and Mobile Connect and all of the building blocks we need to make that happen. We just need to sort of sit down and come up with a framework whereby it can work. What does it mean for payments in the long term is um, uh, uh, something for the audience to decide. But I think more than one person has observed that if you know who all of the participants in a transaction are, and when I say no, I mean recognize. I don't mean no as in you've got their DNA and you know. If you know who all the participants in a transaction are, then payments is really just a little bit of bookkeeping. It's just moving a few bytes here and there. So this infrastructure ought to make payments easier and open up the payments industry to more competition, which ought to be very good, uh, actually healthy for the industry itself, but also good for all of the users. So um, anyway, thanks for listening, and I, and I hope that provides a few ideas uh, to get the discussion going. Thanks very much, guys.